Hi, Lynn. Hi, Annie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to show you your audience before we start and to say also again uh, that we're very excited to have you here. That's great. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're gonna <laughs> we're going to pass you on to the presentation. Okay. Okay. If you okay, need anything, let me know. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm going to start this presentation. And first of all, thank you um, for inviting me to do this. This is really an honor for me, and it's a field that. Um, I've been interested in pretty much my whole life, but I'm going to start this by, by giving a disclaimer. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, and until pretty recently I really wasn't much of a researcher. Um, I'm an artist and a designer, and I have been um, kind of looking for beauty all of my life. Um, before I get into my research, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I grew up making things. I've always made things since I was a, a small child. Um, I studied, started studying painting when I was seven years old, and it was natural for me to go on and study fine arts when I went to college. Along with studying art, I studied art history, and I studied um, about the cave paintings all the way up to contemporary art and learned about great painters and sculptors and the many, many art movements that have pushed the definition and the intent of art through the ages. And pretty much up until the 20th century, the ideals of beauty remained the primary focus of art. Until the Dada movement, which really redefined what the intention of art was. And it was born out of the horrors of the First World War. And the Dada movement rejected everything that art stood for, where art was concerned with traditional aesthetics. Dada ignored aesthetics altogether. Where art was intended to appeal to the senses, data was intended to offend them. And it was this rejection of beauty in art that the data is sought, freeing art from the confines of beauty and creating art that the viewer could be indifferent to. I'm not making an argument against contemporary art. Um, there are lots of reviews and critics critics out there that can do this and lots of volumes written on it. Um, what I am talking about here is what happened to beauty when this happened and how ever since the Dada movement, beauty has become suspect in the art world, and artists who continue to believe in the validity of beauty have been marginalized. The art world crossed a line where beauty once was a requirement, now it was prohibited behind a thinly veiled disdain. And artists that continued to believe in beauty were often marginalized. So I graduated from school with a sense that beauty was no longer relevant on art, and I found myself unable to kind of find a rationale to make artwork that had come so easily to me since childhood. Um, the point of making art had always been driven by beauty for me. That was its function, and I felt that with its function gone, so was mine, and I turned away from art. Fortunately for me, another creative movement came on the scene about the same time. Um, the Memphis Design Group, which was a radical Italian collective under the directive of architect and designer Ettore Satsas, launched a collection of home furnishings in the early 1980s. And this ex exhibition really changed my world. It was wonderful, creative, colorful, innovative objects that had function. They were clearly artistic, but they weren't of the art world. These pieces opened up an entirely new demand and market for products made by artists and architects without the traditional confines of industrial design and engineering. Galleries opened up and we began showing furniture that was labeled art furniture. And before long, the trend kind of spread to the retail market and the New York gift fair. And my partner, Lloyd Schwann, and I, at the time, started a company called Godly Schwann, and we started producing um, uh, pieces that, you know, the design world would have referred to it as art, the art world referred to it as design, and we created um, hundreds and hundreds of objects that people would use, from furniture to tabletop accessories to lighting, and so for like 30 years, I had one foot sort of in the art world while the other foot was in the design world, um, creating objects that had some clear connection to the user. And I had really found sort of my new home. 
And then, of course, there's light. Um, I, about 20 years ago, developed an obsession with lighting. My grandfather was involved in lighting, specific automotive headlight design. He had 90 patents on, on headlights. My father was involved in early fluorescent light development. And so it's sort of in my blood, this pull to light. And I've worked with just about any type of light source I can get my hands on from incandescent to fluorescent to electroluminescent wire to LEDs and fiber optic. I've played with its effect on materials, both as reflectors and diffusers. And I've always just been enamored by the transformation that an object goes through the moment the light is turned on. So while my work with light has definitely been artistic, it has also been functional on some level, and it has ranged from chandeliers and tabletop lamps to curtains that illuminate to skinning an entire building with lines of lights that appear to draw across the facade. But there's always been a user. I've always created for a user that would in some way interact or communicate with my work. So just almost 30 years after I walked away from art, I found my way back to it through light. Um, I was offered an exhibit, and it wasn't really a conscious choice to go back to art. I was offered an exhibit, um, and I didn't have time to create enough three-dimensional work for this solo show, and I thought, well, I'll just draw some lamp sort of uh, imagery, and I will feed fiber optics through it. And so this is an early piece that I had done, a drawing of what I would consider a hanging lamp. And you can see hundreds and hundreds of points, of uh, small points of fiber optic that have been threaded through the, um, the image. I started working with um, different types of imagery. I was sort of pulled towards nature-based imagery, um, some sort of repetition and tiling. And at the time, I couldn't really explain why I was choosing this imagery, which quickly was nature-based or the repeat pattern. Um, it just felt right. It felt um, something about it clicked with me. I was offered a solo show in Cologne, um, for which I filled the gallery with 75 images of birds in flight, and I threaded fiber optics all along the wing tips and the t along the tips of the wings and the tails. And this was the first exhibit that I had had that was a solo show where I could play with the gallery lights. Um, group shows, the other artists get a little pissy when you turn the lights down. Um, they don't, <laughs> needless to say. So we played with the lights in the gallery, dimming them so the fiber optics lit up a bit more, turning them all the way off together so the fiber optics became almost a constellation. And something happened during this month that became kind of the driving force of my research. The curator called me and said that something strange was happening, that the people were coming into the gallery and they were sitting down, not talking to each other. They would stay for multiple hours and just be with the work. She would try to talk to them about the artist. They didn't want to hear anything about the artist. And this is not a typical response. The average amount of time that viewers spend in front of a piece of artwork is 30 seconds. Multiple hours is not the norm. And so this calming effect on the audience was unexpected both to the curator and to myself. And the designer side of my brain that is really curious about the interaction between the work that I produce and the user really took over and wanted to know why. And at this point, the designer part of me, or the designer part of me, things became very interesting. And I began some research to find out why. I went back to study not only about the creative act of making art, but also about the appreciation of art. What is it about art that calls to the viewer? What calms us when we get lost in Monet's water lilies? What feeds our souls when we sit in front of the frenzy of a Pollock? Basically, how does art transform and heal us? And how do we understand and identify beauty? Anthropologists believe that the universal nature of artistic behavior, its appearance throughout all recorded time and across all cultures suggests that art stems from innate needs and desires. Humans don't wait for aesthetics until they've reached comfortable levels of survival. Poor people have been creating beautiful art and objects for over 40,000 years. Think about that in terms of survival. We need food for survival, but we did not get serious about 
getting food for another 30,000 years. It was only 10,000 years ago that the first record of planting crops and having domesticated animals is dated. Artistic expression and appreciation are inherent to our species. Most people have experienced a transformative effect of art at some point in their lives, where you stand in front of a piece and you're just totally mesmerized. This reaction is called the Stendhal syndrome and is described as, get this, a psychosomatic disorder that causes rapid heartbeat, dizziness, fainting, confusion, and even hallucinations when an individual is exposed to art, usually when the art is particularly beautiful or a large amount of art is in a single place. This condition may not actually be emotional or psychosomatic, but more physiologic. In recent studies of the brain, when certain pieces of art were judged to be especially beautiful to a particular person, the portion of the brain where the pleasure rewards center is located was stimulated in the same way it's stimulated when you look at a loved one. In a 2011 University of London study, they found that blood flow increased 10% to the jury response part of the brain when subjects saw a beautiful painting. These findings give credence to what we've always expected, that visual art has a strong positive physiological effect on the brain. The same reward occurs when we discover groupings in an image that reveal order solutions or hidden in imagery. It's that aha moment when we experience, that we experience when we find what was hidden visually. Obviously, this intuitive emotional response is important when you consider that the brain has over two dozen visual areas or modules, each of which is concerned with a different visual attribute, such as color, motion, depth, form. These modules are concerned with extracting correlations or similarities to create patterns that are familiar to us. The output of vision modules goes directly to the portion of the brain concerned with in instinct and mood and controlling emotional emotions and drives before the object has been identified in the portion of the brain where the visual stimuli is identified as recognizable object. Emotion comes before intellect when we're looking at beautiful objects. As far back as ancient Rome, visual exposure to trees, water, and other nature and other objects of nature have been used in healing. Edward Wilson's book, Biophilia, describes the instinctive bond between people and nature and instead insists that our natural affinity for life is the very essence of our humanity and binds us with all other living things. A growing amount of scientific evidence suggests that views of nature in a hospital can be as effective as stress reducing, promoting wellness in healthcare environments. In healthcare settings, patients with a view of nature are more likely to experience hospital stays that are eight and a half percent shorter than otherwise, and they need significantly fewer post surgical painkillers. Simulated landscapes or images depicting nature also speed recovery. One study in East Alabama Medical Center found that drug use for anxiety dropped significantly when the patients were exposed to images of nature. Patients in a Swedish university hospital who were recovering from open heart surgery experienced the least post-operative anxiety when looking at pictures of natural scenes, most specifically those that included water. Studies have shown that human beings break down all visual information into symbols, and we can use those symbols to mimic the effect of actual stimuli. Next slide. Thereby, it's not critical to expo have exposure to actual nature in order to depict exact representations of nature so that we can use symbols in order to represent nature and we'll have the same reactions, okay? So repeated and overlapping pattern that evoke feelings of leaves, or such as in this image, a canopy in the woods, um, has the same effect on the viewer as the actual experience in a natural setting. Many artists and designers have proportioned their work to approximate the golden rectangle in which the ratio of the longer side to the shorter is the golden ratio, Relief this proportion to be aesthetically pleasing. Studies have found that these proportions create a harmony or a balance that we find to be calming. 
Mathematics have also been linked to natural fractals in our reaction. Research has found that visual exposure to these patterns found in the repeated imagery of self-similar geometry can reduce stress by as much as 60%. Now, the ratio of positive to negative space called fractal densities also has an effect on us. People are consistently drawn to patterns approximating a density of one to three, which you'll see in the thing when you look at, up at trees or natural fractals, this is repeated over and over again. If you take a look at the development of Jackson Pollock's work, as his work evolved, his work became closer and closer to that perfect ratio of 1.3, which may be why we find such calm in sitting in front of the Jackson Pollock. Color also stimulates or lowers stress. The color red can raise blood pressure, pulse rate, tension, respiration, and perspiration. Blue is associated with sky and water and has the reverse effect. Orange actually increases your appetite. The human eye can distinguish more than 10 million different colors. So looking at how evolution weans out the unnecessary, it stands to reason that this is not an accident and that color perception likely has a biological function. And needless to say, I can't let the conversation of beauty leave out my obsession with lighting. And it's impossible to discuss beauty without regard to light. Light gives context, atmosphere, drama, and place. And so I turned my attention and my research to light. I found the same premise holds true on a deep level with how we react to light. There's a long history of the benefit of light to human health and psyche. Richard Kelly, a pioneer in lighting design, who was one of the first to question about the experience of light, both natural and artificial. He coined the theory of light energy impacts with three different types of lighting that began in the language for architects to understand the effects of lighting in architecture, comparable to how we relate to light found in nature. And we carry those experience forward into our relationship with artificial light. He wrote extensively about the ability of light to calm or stimulate or focus, depending on the type. Ambient light tends to calm us. If you take a look at, say, out on a foggy day, we tend to be more calmed down. And likewise, artificial light, which would be, you know, your kind of washes across a wall where there's nothing in high definition calms us. Light that focuses us, you can take a look at um, task lighting or spotlights that bring our focus into a particular area. Or the one that I like best, which is called um, the play of brilliance, as you'll see on this slide, it tends to stimulate. It's the light against water, or for me, the fiber optic light. Artificial light takes us back to our relationship with nature. Beyond the visual stimulation, there's growing evidence that exposure to certain wavelengths of light have numerous healing benefits on the body. Patients exposed to morning sunshine need pain medication nearly 25% less often. We also need natural variations of light over daily and seasonal cycles, without which we get listless and depressed. Low-level light therapy is used to cure depression, most notable seasonal affective disorder, with some research results stating it is as good as your standard antidepressant approach, with fewer side effects and much less overall risk. This is where lighting becomes very interesting. Recent studies have shown that certain types of near-infrared light from LEDs actually stimulate cell growth so that it can be used on wounds to increase healing. They found increased cell growth by 155 to 171% in humans, and wound size decreased up to 36% just with the application of light. Philips has been doing some experiments with lighting in terms of pain relief, where certain types of wavelengths of light are being absorbed through the skin, creating a chemical reaction within the body, where your body is creating more nitric oxide, which is a natural pain reliever. Just as the ear has two receptors, one in which we hear, the other in which we're able to keep our balance and stand up, the eye also has been found to have two receptors, one which allows us to see, one that only reacts to certain types of wavelength. The mammalian eye, whether we have vision or not, functions along with this non-visual receptor. 
It also has to do with our moods, our heart rate, our hormone secretion, our alertness, our sleep propensity, body temperature, and gene expression. So the type of wavelength that is being absorbed through the eye is actually having an enormous effect on us on a biological as well as a psychosomatic level. George Brainerd, who is a leading professor and researcher in the field of light and human health, has predicts that over the next decade or two, health benefits will come to be considered one of the primary attributes of light bulbs along with energy consumption, aesthetics, and brightness. And the lighting industry is quickly getting on board with LED lights that not only change light, brightness, and color, but also wavelength. So what does all of this have to do with me? When we took a look at the wavelength of LEDs we were using to illuminate the fiber optics, we found that it was the same blue wavelength used in many of these studies. We had chosen this type of light just because it was the brightest LED we could find, and thus forth, our fiber optics were illuminating more. We had no idea, it was totally by accident, that we were using light that actually has been proven to calm. So this would find, it would support the effect of calming we witnessed during the solo exhibit in Cologne, which may also be the result of an overall positive physiological reaction. With new levels of standards for design of buildings and public space that go beyond the lead standards of environmental concerns and address the overall well-being of people, how will beauty and light be used to benefit humanity? What will be the role of beauty? We often assume in terms of beauty or the philosophy of beauty that we'll know it when we see it. We speak about beauty as though it's a mystery. When in reality, studies have shown that we're genetically pro programmed to seek out and find beauty in specific ways. There's a bridge between the intellectual or sciences and the intuitive or the arts. I'd never much thought about this much before. I was born as an artist, it was natural to me. But when I started to teach, it became clear that although how to create beauty is not natural to everybody, how to recognize beauty comes easily to the majority of people, even if they can't explain why or duplicate it. Most people inherently know what a visually compelling or beautiful piece is. They may not be able to explain why, but 70% of people, when given the task of which is the most pleasing visually in terms of art and design, will choose the same piece. It doesn't require an education in design or art history to achieve this. Of course, all of this must be balanced with the viewer and what he or she brings to the work. People who have more art education or their backgrounds are different may bring a different emotional or history which will affect their involvement. But what we're finding is that a large part of our reaction to visual, visual stimuli is hardwired into who we are as humans. Just as beauty has challenged in the art world and eventually regarded with contempt, so beauty has been challenged at all stages of building and product development. Design also, unfortunately, suffered from a similar struggle with beauty. Designers cringe when their role is defined as decorative part of product development. And we often have kind of walked away from the discussion of beauty. But it's not as though if we walk away from beauty, we're being called to a more ethical or higher moral standing. In fact, I would argue just the opposite. In my work, such as this piece, a friend came to my studio once. She was an old friend, a very serious artist, and she told me that my work was too beautiful to be taken seriously. My research on beauty would tell me the opposite. For every study demonstrating the benefits <laughs> hidden behind particular materials or production methods, there are studies showing how certain shapes, patterns, images, colors, light, or textures can create environmental, social, and economic value. I believe beauty has the power to change lives, and I believe that we have a responsibility to make this world a better place wherever possible. And I believe that there's evidence that will prove beauty can help us do this. I'm now working with a number of healthcare settings as well as researchers to place my work into environments where stress is a factor so we can begin testing. We're looking at how to measure its impact on well-being. And that's where we are. Thank you, thank you so much.